Thanks for being here. Subscribe to Cheating Stories Best, so you don't miss new stories. Trick or Treason Today's story with a similar plot. Enjoy it! Flo, short for Florence, was my wife. I'm Jim. We met in college and got married shortly after graduation. We lived the normal life of husband and wife. We had children, a house, and a mortgage. Flo was a stay-at-home mom until the children left home, and then she resumed her career in real estate. Flo is an attractive woman, and I'm sure she gets picked on at work sometimes, but as far as I know, she has remained faithful to me in our marriage. She has a raunchy sense of humor sometimes, and I think that's what ultimately got our marriage into trouble. We had two children, a boy named Eric and a girl named Patty. At the time this happened, Eric was 21 years old and had graduated from a vocational school after high school. He had his own apartment nearby and worked as an electrician. Patty was 19 years old and a sophomore at a state university about 150 miles away. In the absence of children, we had to look forward to a happy retirement in the future with time to travel and, hopefully, grandchildren to adore. Our nigh life was what I thought was normal. We had a loving relationship that was honed and developed throughout our married life. When we first got married, we had intim almost every night and during the day on weekends. Over time, we began to do this two or three times a week, and that was enough to make me lose the desire. I thought the same thing was happening to Flo. Over the years, I've learned to press all the necessary buttons to bring her to her peak. Almost every situation has a fly in the ointment, and ours appeared in the form of a new neighbor, Roger, and his wife, Alice, who moved next door about five years ago, and we became friends. The problem with Roger was that he was a prankster and loved to play pranks on everyone he was associated with, and much to my chagrin, I was one of the favorite recipients of his jokes. Also, what bothered me even more was that Flo took pleasure in his pranks, especially if I was on the receiving end. I tried to tell her that I didn't like his jokes or her pleasure, but she did not listen and did not retreat. Over time, I realized that Roger was attracted to Flo, and I think he was preoccupied with thoughts of getting into her panties. Whenever we were together, he and Flo would laugh together at his sometimes lewd jokes, while Alice and I would just smile politely at their antics. When we were out in public, I knew Alice was just as depressed as I was about some of the things they were doing. I remember one day on the beach, Roger was making fun of some people on a passing boat, and to my horror, Flo followed suit. Alice and I were shocked by their carelessness and reprimanded them to no avail as they laughed hysterically together. Just before the end, I began to suspect that things were getting out of control. We were at Roger and Alice's house, and Alice and I sat in the backyard while Flo followed Roger into the house to help take out the drinks. Alice and I talked for a while until we realized that Flo and Roger had been gone for quite some time, so we went inside to look for them. When we entered the kitchen, we found it empty, but as soon as we started looking for them, they came out of the living room hugging each other, giggling, and laughing. Roger had lipstick on his collar and around his mouth, while Flo's lipstick appeared smeared, and her hair was disheveled. Alice and I just stood there in shock with our mouths open. Oh, hi guys, sorry we're late with drinks but I had to show Flo my prints, Roger spoke, seemingly oblivious to their appearance. Alice and I continued to stand there, still stunned by their obvious brazen audacity. Roger has some wonderful engravings, you know what I'm talking about, don't you, Alice? Flo commented with a grin. By this time, I had gathered my thoughts and finally spoke, what the hell is going on? I asked. Flo, how come Roger has lipstick on his face and clothes, and you look like you've been kissed? Oh, that's because I was so happy to see Roger's engravings, I must have gotten carried away. You don't mind, do you? She asked, trying to keep a calm expression on her face. I began to understand what was happening when I looked at their faces. Roger had that smirk on his face that you get when he makes one of his jokes, and Flo was looking away so I couldn't see how hard she was trying not to laugh. I felt my irritation growing. Alice was not yet tuned into what was happening when she finally spoke, what the hell is going on, Roger? If you think you're going to continue a relationship with another woman in my house, you might want to reconsider. When Roger and Flo suddenly started laughing loudly, I think Alice finally realized what was going on and smiled shyly. However, I exploded at them, one of these days, you two will go too far, and things will end very badly. 
Oh, relax, honey, it's just a joke. If you could see the expressions on her faces, you would think it was funny too, Flo told me, still laughing. Come on, guys, let me get you a drink and we can laugh about this together, Roger said as he walked into the kitchen, followed by Flo, who was still laughing. Alice and I simply shrugged and followed them, shaking our heads in disgust. One day, Alice, they will go too far, I predicted again. One of these times, one of their jokes will backfire and someone will get hurt. Alice agreed with me. When we got back to our house that night, I think Flo knew I was still angry, especially about her part in the prank. Honey, I'm really sorry, she told me. I just get carried away sometimes. Nothing happened. I just smeared some lipstick on his face and collar and ruffled his hair. We never thought you guys would get angry. We were almost about to skip the whole thing when you and Alice finally showed up. Are you still mad at me? This was just a joke. I'm trying not to get angry, Flo, but you need to stop interfering with Roger's pranks. I almost had a heart attack when I saw you looking like you were kissing him. You know how I feel about loyalty. I know, honey. I feel the same way and would never do anything to hurt you. Well, please remember this, okay? Kiss me hard and tell me that you forgive me. A couple of weeks later, we were invited back to Roger and Alice's for dinner on Saturday night. But just as we had finished eating, a call came in that Roger mistook for Alice. Alice worked at a local hospital as an emergency room nurse. After hanging up, he turned to Alice. It was the emergency room. There was a serious car accident and several people were injured. They want you to come right now. Oh, damn. I'll change and go, Alice said. Ten minutes later, Alice was heading to the hospital. After she left, Roger turned to me and asked if I would help him with a project in his basement. While I was there, Flo was silent all this time, turning away from me. I didn't think anything of it at the time, but then I remembered. Certainly, what can I do? I asked, standing up to follow him into the basement. I want you to hold something for me while I attach it to the ceiling. It's not too heavy, but I can't hold it there and attach it at the same time, and Alice is too short to hold it. Okay, it sounds simple. Trust me, it is. And it will only take a minute. As we descended the stairs, he led me to a metal support post that was installed next to the stove on the floor above. He removed a small metal box with a power cord hanging from it from his workbench and lifted it to the ceiling between a support pipe and the furnace. I noticed that Flo had followed us down and was standing watching us with a smile on her face. Again, I didn't think anything of her presence or her strange smile. Now, I want you to hold this here while I attach it, Roger told me. What the hell is this? I asked, raising my hands to hold the box. Since Roger was standing between the pipe and the furnace, I had to wrap my hands around the pipe to press it against the basement ceiling. I'll show you in a minute, but first, let me grab my tools. He disappeared behind his desk, leaving me holding the box. He came back a second or two later, and I didn't see what he had in his hand until I heard two quick clicks as something hard and metal grabbed my wrists. Suddenly, I realized that I had been tricked, and I was handcuffed to the pipe. I turned my head in shock to watch as Roger walked up to Flo and put his arm around her waist as they stood there looking at me. My mind was in turmoil, but I managed to say, What the hell is going on, Roger? Take these damn handcuffs off me. Well, buddy, you know I can't do that. Flo says she liked my prints so much that she wants to see them again. But this time, we don't want you or Alice around to watch. With that, he and Flo turned and walked back up the steps from the basement. Flo walked and swayed her hips exaggeratedly. Let me go, damn it. You're going too far this time, Roger, and you'll regret it if you don't let me go right now. Just calm down a little, dear. I just want to look at some engravings, Flo said as they disappeared from view, laughing and giggling. Meanwhile, I struggled with the handcuffs, trying to figure out if there was any way to free myself. I realized the hopelessness of my situation. The pipe was embedded in the concrete floor below and bolted to a steel I-beam above. As I listened, I could hear them moving into the master bedroom directly above me, and I heard Flo giggling excitedly. The shoes fell on the carpet above me, and I heard, hurry up and take off those panties, and Flo replied, I want you very much. 
My rage grew by the minute as I continued to madly struggle with the handcuffs. I heard the bed begin to creak above me and imagined them having a night. I cursed the handcuffs and my unfaithful wife overhead. My wrists were raw and bleeding as I continued to jerk and squirm in the handcuffs. My mind was in a whirlpool of emotions as I heard Roger grunt and Flo make a sound in rhythm. Then there was silence upstairs for a few minutes. I stopped struggling and just lay on the hard cement floor with my hands wrapped around the pipe. I felt a terrible sadness in my heart when I finally heard Flo exclaim, Oh, that was really good, Roger. Someday I will have to see your prince again. I suppose we should get dressed and go downstairs to see how Jim is doing, Roger said. Okay, Flo. I need to rest for a minute, but Alice should be back soon from that fake call I sent her, and I don't want her to see me in bed with you, he added. A few minutes later, I heard footsteps on the basement stairs, but I didn't look up when they approached where I was lying. Oh, hell, I heard Roger say. Look at his wrists. They're all covered in blood. Honey, it was just a joke. Nothing happened, Flo exclaimed. Oh, God, I'm so sorry. Hurry up, Roger, unlock the cuffs so we can bandage his wrists. Oh, God, oh, God. I never thought he would take it so personally, she continued. I looked up at them, tears streaming down my face, as Roger fumbled with the key in the handcuffs. Roger, you better give Flo this key before you unlock me, and then run. When I'm free, I'll make you regret the day you were born, I warned. Roger looked me in the face and silently handed the key to Flo. He began to move towards the stairs, looking at me with fear as Flo began to unlock the handcuffs. When she finally removed the handcuffs, I heard Roger's truck start up and the tires screech as it pulled away. Standing up, I looked down at Flo, still squatting on the floor, a look of fear on her face. You better find somewhere else to stay tonight, or I could cause you serious physical harm. And you better call before you try to get home, I threatened. Oh, honey, I'm so sorry. This was just a joke. We didn't do anything, Flo pleaded, tears streaming down her face. Flo, I never want to hear that nonsense about it being a joke ever again. For me, my perception is that you did it, and that's all that matters now. From now on, I will act as if you committed adultery and cuckolded me. You can expect a call from my lawyer in a few days. We're done, I exclaimed, turning and heading up the stairs. No, Jim, please, nothing happened, she howled at me from the basement. What will I tell the children? I didn't answer and headed towards the front door. Just as I was getting into my car, a very crazy Alice pulled into their driveway. Where the hell is my shitty hubby? There was no accident, and I didn't need an ambulance, she exclaimed as she got out of the car. Suddenly, she noticed my wrists. What happened, Jim? Dear God, look at your wrists. Let me bandage them for you. Roger and Flo came up with another joke, Alice. This time, they went too far, and I'm divorcing Flo, I explained. Dear God, what did they do? You can hear it from Flo and Roger. I'm heading home, and will do the dressing myself when I get there. You can tell my cheating ex-wife that she will find her clothes and belongings on the porch. If she wants to get into our house again, she better get a court order, Alice said, distraught, as she hastily entered the house. I got into the car and drove home, still seething inside. When I got home, I washed my wrists thoroughly with antibacterial soap, applied antibiotic ointment, and bandaged them as best I could. I then methodically began packing Flo's washcloths, makeup, and other personal items into plastic trash bags and placing them on the porch. The phone rang while I was working, but I refused to answer it or even check the caller ID. When I finished, I locked the door, undressed, and lay down on the bed. Even though I was emotionally and physically destroyed, I couldn't sleep for a long time. When I woke up in the morning, the phone rang again, but I refused to accept the call. I got up, took a shower, and had breakfast. Then I replaced the bandages on my wrists. Around 10 o'clock, the doorbell rang, and I looked out to see Alice standing in the doorway. Opening it, I motioned for her to come inside. Well, they really did it this time, didn't they? She said as she entered. I'm afraid so. What are you going to do? I asked. Like I told her, I'm divorcing her. But they say nothing happened. It was just one of their jokes. 
Flo desperately wants to talk to you. My perception is that they did it, and as far as I understand, that is reality. I will make an appointment with a divorce lawyer first thing Monday morning, I told her calmly. You're really angry, aren't you? Can't you wait until you cool down before you decide to do something so drastic? You've been investing in each other for almost 24 years. Do you want to give it up without trying to save anything? I will not allow you to cuckold me. I've told Flo this many times, and as far as I'm concerned, she cuckolded me, and now it's over. But they claim that nothing happened. They just made sounds as if it really happened. I don't know if this happened. These are just their words. It was as if it could happen, and they have no way of proving that it didn't happen. So I have to agree with my perception that this actually happened. She had no respect for me at all. Can't you leave everything as it is and go to a consultation? Flo is just terribly torn over this. Last time I warned her about such things, but she didn't listen. I'm done talking. We'll just let the lawyer sort it out. If you're happy with Roger's role in this, then you can continue to live with him. But don't count on me. Just tell Roger that he better stay away from me in the future. I haven't decided what to do with Roger yet, but I really hate to see you guys break up over this. Roger is very remorseful about all this and wants me to convey his sincere apologies to you. Make sure he understands that our friendship is over. As much as I'd like to remain friends with you, Alice, I think it would be best if we didn't date again while you stayed with him. Is there anything I can tell Flo that might give her some hope that you will forgive her? If she can prove to me that she didn't have a night with Roger, I'll think about it. And I don't take Roger or her word for it that nothing happened and it was just a joke. I feel like it happened, and that's why it happened. Okay, Jim. I'll tell her. I'll miss you. I'll miss you too, Alice. Now let me load her things into your car so you can take them to her. I'm guessing you still have it. She is moving in with her sister this afternoon. Her sister lived on the other side of town. She was a widow and lived alone, so there would be room for Flo, perhaps indefinitely. After loading Flo's bags into Alice's car, I waved to her as she drove away, then returned to the house. The first thing I did was look up the number of a locksmith to change the locks on my house. I suddenly realized that if I left for work on Monday and Flo came back to the house and changed the locks, I would end up on the street. I agreed on new locks that same day and then pulled the plug from my phone and left my cell phone turned off. I spent the whole day doing work around the house until the locksmith arrived. After he left, I got in my car and headed to the local supermarket, where I bought a few frozen dinners to keep me going for a week or so, and then headed back to my lonely house. I really missed Flo after almost 24 years together, but I couldn't shake my anger at her and what she and Roger had done to me. That evening, around 7.30, I was watching TV when the doorbell rang. Looking out the window, I saw Flo's sister, Mary, standing at the front door. Hello, Mary, was my greeting as I opened the door to let her in. Hello, Jim. Can I take a few minutes of your time? Of course, I said as we walked into the living room. She sat down, and I sat in the chair and asked if she wanted something to drink. Coca-Cola would be quite enough, she said. I got her one and one for myself and returned to the living room. I guess you know what it is, she said, taking a sip of her drink. Yes. Are you going to ask me to take her back? If this is so, then you came in vain. No, she said. She told me everything about it. How are your wrists? They're scabby now, and everything should be fine. I don't see any signs of infection. Flo will be glad to hear that. You know, she's almost ready to have a nervous breakdown, especially since you don't want to talk to her. And that's why I'm here, to convey a message. More than one message, rather. I will listen to your messages, but I don't promise anything in return. First of all, she loves you very much and is very sorry for what she did. Okay. Anything else? She wants you to know that she's willing to take a lie detector test to prove that she's not lying when she says nothing happened with Roger or anyone else. This is the only proof she can offer you. This was a new possibility that I hadn't thought of, and I thought about it for a few minutes while Mary stared at me and continued to sip her coke. It sounds normal to me, but I want to set some conditions. First of all, results that prove she didn't have intim with Roger don't mean I'll take her back. 
Secondly, Roger will have to take the same test, and his test results will have to match hers. Third, I need the approval of whoever administers the tests and questions. And fourth, I will not pay for the tests. That sounds reasonable to me, Jim. But couldn't you be more confident about taking her back if the test results show they're not lying? No. She hurt me deeply, and even if I bring her back, it will be a long time before I forgive her. Okay, Jim. I'll give her your terms. I really regret this. I wanted to be angry at her for her stupidity when she showed up this afternoon, but she was such a pitiful sight that I don't believe anything I could say would make her feel any worse. She knows she did a very stupid thing and also hurt you terribly. I'll have to give her some pills to help her sleep tonight. I also want to tell you that she called your children and told them what she did. I think they were a little upset with her because she hasn't stopped crying since she talked to them. Well, I better go back and deliver your message. Thanks for the cola. Okay, Mary. Thanks for coming all the way here. I appreciate your concern. After she left, I sat down to think about the situation. Some of my initial anger had cooled down a bit, and I could now think more clearly about what I wanted. I decided to pour myself a glass half full of scotch and then went to the kitchen to add an ice cube. Without returning to my seat, I wandered around the house, looking at all the things that were memories of our married life together. Did I really want to end this? I was brought out of my thoughts and memories by the doorbell ringing. Looking out the window, I saw our daughter Patty standing at the front door, looking clearly unhappy. Oh, I thought. She had just discovered that the locks had been changed and her key didn't work. Opening the door, Patty immediately walked inside, giving me a hostile look. What's with the locks, Dad? And why don't you answer the calls? I had to drive 150 miles to find out what was going on. Sorry, Patty. I didn't mean to not talk to your mother. I heard from your Aunt Mary that she told you what she did. Yeah, and I'm really mad at you for kicking her out just because of a joke. Can't you forgive her and let her come home? When she called me to tell me what she had done, I realized that she was a complete fool, Patty. It was more than just a joke, and I warned her before that I didn't like the way she and our friend Roger kept up their jokes. But she didn't listen. I couldn't get too much out of my mom on the phone, but I understand that it was just a joke. What was so bad about that? Patty continued. I started by telling her about the lipstick smudge prank they had pulled earlier in our subsequent discussions. Then I told her about the joke, rolled up my sleeves, and showed her the scars on my wrists. Oh, Daddy, this is terrible. Was that when you kicked her out? Yes. They may have had intimate intercourse. It really sounded like what they said, because I know the sounds your mom makes in the bedroom. Either that, or they are very good actors. I understand that. They did this, and this is my reality until she can prove otherwise. I asked your mother to take a lie detector test and asked Roger to take it. If the test results are true, I will have to believe her. But it hurt me so much that she thought I would accept the fact that I was a weakling and a cuckold and would laugh out loud at their so-called joke. I may still not be able to live with her again. I'm really sorry about all this, Dad. I hope you and Mom can get through this because I love you both, despite what she did. I'm trying to make it happen, baby, because I really miss your mom. But I still can't get over her disrespect for me. Okay, Daddy. I guess I can't ask for more. Now that I know what happened, I'm going to visit my mom and see if I can calm her down. I'll probably spend the night at Aunt Mary's and I have to go back to school tomorrow. Please turn on your phone so I can contact you, and I know Eric wants to talk to you too. He's at that job upstate, and he was trying to call you after your mom called him. Okay, baby. I'll turn the phones back on as soon as you leave. Give me a hug. I hugged her and pressed her to me. She was so much like her mother that it was scary at times, and I loved her very much. Bye, Daddy, she told me, opening the door of her car. I waved to her as she pulled out of the driveway and headed up the street. Then I returned to my solitary drink, turning my phones back on. A couple of days after Flo's sister Mary visited me, she called me and told me that Flo had agreed to my terms for the lie detector test, and she had gotten Roger to agree to it too. Roger agreed to pay for his own test to show his remorse for being part of the prank. 
Mary also gave me the name and phone number of the testing administrator. My anger at Flo for being part of the joke had cooled somewhat, but I felt so depressed. If she loved me and didn't have a night with Roger, how could she be part of such a humiliating joke on me? I was slowly coming to the conclusion that perhaps her love for me had passed despite her protests about wanting to get back together with me. It may come down to a simple decision of whether I want a loveless marriage if tests prove there was no night. Flo tried to call me several times, but I just hung up when I heard her voice. After that, all her communication with me was through her sister, and I received calls from her every day, mostly about how sorry Flo was and how she wanted to go home. But I kept telling them that I wouldn't make a decision until the lie detector tests were done. Around this time, our son Eric began calling me, begging me to forgive his mother and let her come home. I tried to explain what happened and why his mother's actions made me feel so bad, but he couldn't understand my pain and continued to insist that I let her come home. I realized that I could end up in an estranged relationship with my son if it turned out that we were divorced. It was some comfort to know that our daughter Patty was more understanding of what I was going through and more supportive. After receiving information from Mary about the name of the test administrator, I called several professionals in the legal and police fields and learned that this guy was often used by the police. I was assured that he would conduct an impartial test. I called and made an appointment with him the next day. I learned that he had already been contacted by Flo and Roger and had a test scheduled for each of them in two days. They both listed my name as an interested party with authority to control the questions asked. The next day, I explained to my boss that I needed some personal time and went down to the test administrator's office. His name was Jack Heron, and I explained to him the problem and that I needed to solve it by testing Flo and Roger to determine whether they were having intim or not. We discussed the questions he would ask, and he told me that he would ask the same questions to both Flo and Roger, collate the answers from both of them, and give me a final written report. He agreed that if the test results for both matched, it would make it certain that a night had not occurred. If this had not been the case, I would probably never have been able to trust her again, and divorce would have been inevitable. If the tests showed that they were both lying, I could begin divorce proceedings immediately. As far as I could tell, it wasn't difficult. I returned to work feeling more confident that I would soon figure out whether Intim was involved. However, deep down, I knew that difficult decisions lay ahead. For the next three days, I went to work as usual and stayed late so as not to return to an empty house. I would eat at a nearby diner, and when I got home, I would drink whiskey and then lie down in my empty bed. It was difficult to fall asleep. I really missed Flo and the warmth and love she brought to our marriage before the joke started. On the morning of the test, I felt unsure. All it took was a clear lie detector test report, and I would welcome Flo home with the confidence that after my reaction to their last prank scare her, I would never be the butt of any stupid jokes again. This feeling lasted until the phone rang at just after 11. It was Alice. Jim, this is Alice. I found something you really need to see. Roger is at the testing center. Can you come right now? The tone of her voice did not bode well, so I quickly headed to the next house. As is our custom, I walked straight through the front door and heard Alice call out that she was in the office. I walked in and saw her sitting at her desktop computer. There was a worried expression on her face. Jim, I want you to see something, she said. I pulled my chair closer. Roger has been a little secretive since Tuesday. A couple of times, I walked past this door, and he hastily minimized something on the monitor. Also, he sometimes leaves the room when he is talking on the phone. Yesterday, I'm pretty sure he talked to Flo on the phone. I just had my first chance to look into our computer without him in the house. With that, Alice clicked on the Google icon at the bottom of the screen, which opened the application. I don't know if Roger realizes that unless you delete them all, Google searches will be saved. This is the history of his searches since Tuesday. My blood froze when I read some of what was researched. There were four different options on the topic, how to cheat a lie detector test. Alice and I sat side by side for the next 30 minutes and read many of the pages that Alice's husband was looking through. When we had read enough, we retired to her living room and discussed what we thought it all meant. We were still talking when we heard Roger's car pull up outside. Soon, the front door opened, and he entered. He looked at me wearily, muttered a greeting, then walked over to the couch across from Alice and me before sitting down. 
If I hadn't been keeping an eye on him, I might have missed the slight limp as he limped on his left leg. This was the only answer I needed. Raj, I believe you passed the test with flying colors, I said. Truth be told, I was pretty sure nothing had happened that day anyway. Out of the corner of my eye, I noticed Alice gave me a puzzled look. Roger returned before I could tell her my plan. If you're willing to swear that you and Flo will never pull another trick as long as you live, I'm willing to come over and shake your hand and put this all behind us. Heck, I probably won't even bother reading the report. His face showed great relief, and he readily gave me his word that he would swear. Smiling, I stood up and walked towards him. He slowly rose towards me, extending my right hand. I took another step and stood firmly on his right leg. Such a movement should have caused slight discomfort. Instead, the blood drained from his face before he let out a blood-curdling scream. Throwing his body back onto the couch. Desperately, he used both hands to pull his foot out from under mine before ripping off the shoe. Alice and I watched as the shoe finally came off. We could see blood dripping from his sock. He was still makes a sound. A sideways glance at Alice told me she was embarrassed by the blue. I continued to watch her face, smiling as I saw the penny drop and she made the connection between what we had read earlier and the wound on Roger's leg. I won't bother reading the report because I know it will be complete nonsense, I said. Did that nail you drove into your shoe when you pressed it while answering their security questions help cover up your lies? It had to happen, didn't it? Make yourself sweat, get your heart rate up with innocuous questions, so that when you tell them, the results don't look like a lie. The pain on Roger's face eased a little, replaced by an expression of despair as he looked from me to Alice. Yes, I really cheated, and I told Flo how to do it, but not for the reason you think, dude, really. Listen, Alice, this should be good. Alice and I sat back down, and Roger gently applied pressure to the soul to stop the bleeding. I looked at Alice and saw her frowning at the mess he had made on the floor. I thought about suggesting that she make him clean the carpet with her tongue. To his credit, Roger didn't seem to think of anything to say to hype this new development. We didn't know what questions you asked the guy. What's so difficult about the question did you two haven't him? I interrupted him. Yes, I know we both would have passed this with flying colors, but we were afraid that you would slip into something more subtle. For example, well, has our behavior always been such that it passes the test for marriage? At this point, Alice angrily intervened in the conversation. And the answer to that question obviously was a big fat no. Why else would you bother sticking a damn nail into your shoe before the test? I'm guessing the fact that you came with the nail still inside means you forgot to bring extra shoes or a set of pliers. You've never been very good at thinking ahead, have you? Please, honey, I didn't want to lose you, and Flo certainly didn't want to lose Jim. So, my dear husband... When and what did you do that would not pass the test for marriage? Roger shifted in his chair and answered in a very quiet voice. It was that day we wanted to just pretend we were doing something upstairs. We were just jumping on the bed. As you can imagine, we were both fully dressed, he hastily added. We were jumping up and down, making the bed squeak. And I don't even remember who started it, but somehow we started rubbing each other through our clothes. Um, we both really enjoyed it. We were so stupid. I was a little confused. I'm a good judge of people, and this smacks of truth. If that weren't the case, Roger was extremely good at making up excuses on the fly. I looked at said Alice, is this good enough for you? No way. This couple has proven that they are such consummate liars and schemers that I am not even close to satisfied. Roger, put some antiseptic on your leg, bandage it, and then I think you should go. I have something to think about, not to mention cleaning up another one of your beautiful messes. Alice snapped, pointing to a stain on the carpet near Roger's foot. If Roger wasn't a fantastic actor, the look of horror on his face showed that he was incredibly worried about the future of his marriage. He blurted out, I have a video, Alice. Almost simultaneously, my question came up, which video? We sounded like a sick version of two people singing in harmony. I installed a video camera in our bedroom before we handcuffed you in the basement. I filmed it all, I beat Alice to the punch. Then why the hell didn't you say this a few days ago? Roger didn't need to answer that question. 
If the video showed them jerking each other off, even while fully clothed, it wouldn't be something two spouses desperate to make peace with their partners would want to make public. I, for one, firmly believe that the line of infidelity extends far beyond actual penetrative actions. Any form of intimacy, even a kiss on the lips, would be crossing the line of what is permitted. I wanted to, but Flo thought you'd freak out. We told Roger to bandage his leg and then showed us the video while he was out of the room. I sent Flo a message. I couldn't resist hammering a nail into her coffin of fear. Take the nail out of your shoe and come to Alice's house. Roger is going to show us a video. Usually, it's about a minute's walk from Mary's house to ours, but it was a good 35 before there was a knock on the door. Alice opened it and let in Flo and her sister Mary. Flo's makeup was ruined, and her eyes were red. Mary explained that my wife panicked as soon as she read my message and realized that I had caught her playing nails. Flo didn't look nearly as calm about the test results as Roger did when he first came home. Mary simply looked at me and raised her eyebrows at Flo's further self-destructive behavior. Flo tried to hug me, but I sat her down on the couch next to me. She continued to look at my face, I guess to understand how I felt. I wondered if Mary had any idea what was in the video. Alice and I did not sit idle during those 35 minutes. Our conversation revolved around what we would most likely do if the video turned out to be exactly what Roger said. Alice had already decided that she would probably forgive Roger for letting things get out of hand in the bedroom, that is, after she let him stew for a while. I was more ambivalent. My emotional reflex was that my wife had cheated on me, which I always swore was unforgivable. However, my logic circuits were calmer. Flo had been a model wife for 24 years, and her children had already made it clear that they would be devastated if I didn't forgive her. A minute after everyone was settled, Roger appeared with his laptop, a USB flash drive sticking out of one port, and a cable sticking out of the other. He placed the computer next to the TV and turned it on. I thought it was strange that he didn't just put the flash drive in the TV, but then I remembered Alice telling me that he wasn't that tech savvy. Once the image on the computer screen matched the image on the TV, Roger muttered another apology and pressed play. Flo was looking away from everyone else in the room and the TV. She knew my stance on fidelity, and this must have been a terribly awkward situation for her. Mary looked attentively at the screen as if she had no idea what was about to happen. Roger looked more relaxed again. He sat down next to Alice and tried to grab her hand, but she pulled it away. The clip was only about 10 minutes long and pretty much showed what Roger had already described. It was almost completely not pretty. A few seconds after it all started, both main characters appeared fully dressed, just like Roger said. Flo flipped him over on his back, then straddled him, returning to the camera and saying word for word what I heard when I was handcuffed in the basement. We saw that it was Roger who started the hand game, but he was only a few seconds ahead of Flo. This was very difficult for me to watch for several reasons. Firstly, because no man with any self-esteem, and outside of a bunch of crazy cuckolds, wants to watch his wife with another guy in that situation. Secondly, it gave me ugly PTSD as I heard again the words that had so devastated me less than a week ago. It made my wrists burn and throb with the memory of my helplessness to prevent what was happening in the room above me. About halfway there, I closed my eyes and tried to block out the noise. I didn't open my eyes again until the silence that followed their mutual climaxes filled the room. Silence has never seemed so loud and pervasive. Judging by the silence that reigned in the room, even normal breathing sounds could not be heard. I was not alone in my feelings. I looked at the screen, seeing Flo and Roger very quickly separate before leaving the camera's view. The paused screen showed an empty bed. The complete silence in the room lasted for several uncomfortable seconds after the clip ended. Mary looked at Flo with disgust. Roger looked at Alice hopefully. Flo focused on a spot on the floor in the corner. The silence was broken by Alice jumping to her feet, quickly followed by Roger. You're a brat, a stinking traitor. The petite nurse's words were shocking. The worst thing I'd ever heard her say in the past was cursing or bloody. Roger was certainly shocked, judging by the look on his face. The crack when her open palm touched his cheek was like a gunshot. She was foaming at the mouth. I can honestly say I have never seen someone so angry. But honey, don't you dare touch me, you treacherous little. 
Roger ducked and thus avoided a second slap. He winced, shifting his weight to his right leg. He looked confused. This whole video is a lie, but why? We invited Jim and Flo later in the evening, didn't we? We were going to sit outside on the patio, weren't we? Don't you remember, darling? Alice asked, although it sounded more like a growl. But we decided to spend it indoors because it rained all day. Do you remember now? Roger still looked confused but nodded in agreement with what Alice was saying. Alice pointed at the TV screen in anger. Look at this idiot! Sunlight pours in through the window. This was filmed not only on a sunny day but also in the morning. This window loses direct sun until midday. You fabricated the whole damn story, didn't you? Roger's face lost its confused expression and took on an expression of horror. That was all I needed to admit their guilt. The sudden mental shift from considering forgiveness to an unapologetic decision was confusing, and I hate being embarrassed. I could, and in fact agreed, that there was probably a good reason for cheating on a lie detector test. There was only one reason, they doctored the video. The next few seconds were very tense. Flo groaned loudly and ran out the door. Mary just sat there, stunned. Alice moved towards Roger, who tried to move past me to use me as a shield. I took one step and, with all my strength, brought my foot down on his injured leg. Instinctively, he doubled over. When his head reached an almost horizontal position, it met my knee, which was going the other way. His head jerked up again, blood spraying from his flattened nose. He joined Flo in a headlong flight away from home. The three of us were locked in a terrible picture. Alice stood trembling, tears streaming down her face. I knew exactly how she felt. For the second time in a week, the man I had loved unconditionally for almost a quarter of a century tore my heart to shreds. That this was the same person who kept me hopeful between episodes was doubly stunning. Mary continued to sit and stare at the TV screen, I assume stunned by her sister's stupidity and, if I may say, horrified by the lies Flo has no doubt told her over the past week. I walked up to Alice and hugged her. I held her as she trembled uncontrollably over the death of her marriage. I have always preferred to grieve in private. I would do it later, here and now. I was cool, clinically calm as one can be in a crisis, and had already begun to draw up a list of questions and lines of inquiry. I was already beginning to regret that I had let Roger leave with only a broken nose. I looked at Mary, wondering why she stayed. Was it to apologize for her part in all of this once we were settled? Was it her inability to tear her eyes away from the train wreck right in front of her? Or should we have waited until we calmed down to stand up for her sister again? Unable to answer this question without breaking contact with Alice and with no intention of doing so, I allowed my mind to drift at high speed. The fact that Roger was quite intelligent, a skilled manipulator, and a good actor was now obvious, although he seemed not as smart as Alice. If she hadn't noticed the sunshine clue, even now, we would probably both still be part of two successful couples. Looking back, the remade video was inspired. I still had a hard time reconciling this with the fact that I was faking it. I would bet my life that the soundtrack matched the words I heard that weekend. The inevitable logical conclusion that certainty led to fit neatly into that same slot in my mind, like the penultimate piece of a puzzle. They either dubbed the old soundtrack over new visual footage or copied the words and sounds in real time. Both scripts were based on them recording their actions during the original episode. Suddenly, Roger's actions playing the file through his laptop made sense. I hugged Alice one last time, sat her down on the couch, and walked over to my laptop. Thank God it hadn't gone into sleep mode yet, which would require a password to regain access. Stupid, I thought to myself. If that were the case, I could just look at the flash drive on another device. Obviously, my brain was also foggy with everything that had happened. With my fingers dancing across the keys and mouse, I closed the software to play the video that would be presented on the Explorer screen. It informed us that we had just watched me and Flo make it. There were also files marked from 2 to 7. Two more files stood out from the rest like dog eggs. One was called Me and Flo Original, the other was called Basement. I double-clicked the last one, then slid along the progress bar. About three quarters of the way there, I was again suspended from that bar in the damned basement, filmed by an obviously hidden camera. I closed the clip, 
Too many bad memories. The file marked original was much larger than the subsequent ones. Looking at Alice and receiving her approving nod, I pressed the button. It overlooked Roger in Alice's bedroom. The view was different than in Video 8, which made me run down the hallway to that room to compare the two views. Half a minute of detective work led me to the conclusion that the original camera was probably hidden on a bookshelf. While subsequent versions were most likely taken from a camera mounted on a tripod at the foot of the bed. When I returned to the living room, the small counter at the bottom of the screen read 1 minute 5, with over an hour left. Roger obviously didn't know how to edit either. I skipped ahead to 20 minutes before the end, then moved at 30 second intervals until the action started going back half a minute. I sat down on the sofa next to Alice and grabbed her hand for support, both for myself and for her. Let's just say that the original version was very different from the subsequent ones. The only thing they had in common was that it all started with Flo pushing Roger onto his back. About 25 seconds later, I heard Alice and Mary gasp in unison. Due to the angle at which the video was filmed, Flo's face was visible as she turned her head to the side and looked down and to the left of the camera, in other words. To a grate at floor level that opened into a channel that carried the sounds on which their joke relied to the basement below. The basement where I was held captive. The look on Flo's face, the one that made the two ladies gasp, was disgusting. My wife knew exactly what was going on in my head in the basement that night, and she loved it. My own ever so loving wife took pleasure in mentally torturing me. I fought a strong urge to vomit. When Roger saw where Flo's eyes were focused on the screen, he grinned evilly. Too shocked to check the time, but a few seconds must have passed. The rest of the video played out pretty much what I imagined I would do while in the basement. With the wisdom of hindsight, I think it was Flo's brutal enjoyment of the situation that emboldened Roger and spurred on the subsequent sequence of events. Having said that, if I were a gambler, I'd put money on this being Roger and Flo's first time. And the video certainly showed that what started out as a relatively innocent situation quickly spiraled out of control. I was pretty sure Roger knew he enjoyed watching another being humiliated, but it was likely that Flo had stumbled across her kink that day. After the show ended, Mary asked me if there was a future for Flo and me. I could tell by her demeanor that she was not optimistic. I stopped for at least a minute to sort out my feelings. No, not in this life, Mary. Ironically, if Flo had come to me later and told me that it started out as a joke but got out of control, as it seemed in the original video, then perhaps I would have considered forgiving her. But no, they conspired to falsify history and fool the lie detector test. This is a level of deception that I never thought she was capable of. It makes me wonder how well I know her. What else did she deceive me about? Plus, we haven't seen all the workout videos yet. After her initial misstep, she returned and made at least one more intimate physical contact with Roger. How many times did they enjoy each other during these training sessions? Then there was the expression she had on her face. I know you saw it too. I'm sorry, Mary, but it's over between us. Mary nodded grimly. Please don't destroy her publicly, Jim. It would only humiliate your children. If you give me a copy of the video, I will calmly explain this to mom and dad, Flo, and even your children if necessary. I nodded and thanked her. She left sadly but with a determined expression on her face. Alice had already opened the phone book in the legal section. Alice and I consoled each other for weeks, however, it was clear that any relationship is doomed to bad memories, and we parted as friends. I was leaving her house late one night after once again comforting the hell out of her when I ran into an angry Roger in her front yard. How could he ever hope to reconcile with Alice if I was seeing her five times a week? What a delusional idiot. Looking around for potential witnesses, I took great pleasure in breaking his nose again. I was very proud of myself. The memory of that sadistic grin on his face just before he ended my marriage would have been provocation enough. Alice ended up practically crucifying him in the divorce. When he demanded his share of the assets, she, with my full blessing, threatened that I would charge him with unlawful restraint using the video of me in the basement as evidence. He cut his losses and disappeared soon after. Good. I must have been bluffing. I probably could have shrugged off the public humiliation of myself, and I didn't care about Flo's image, but I didn't want to embarrass my kids or Flo's extended family. 
Shortly after I bloodied Roger's nose, about a week after the video session, I received a message from Flo wondering if the fact that I hadn't released the video to her kids, family, and friends meant that we had a chance in the future. The fact that she only linked to one clip told me that she didn't know that I had seen the original. She probably assumed that Roger wouldn't be so stupid as to leave all the clamps on one stick. The message also reminded me that I didn't send the clips to Mary. I hadn't heard from my children that week, but given the self-absorbed nature of young people, was that a surprise? This also implied that Mary and Flo were not communicating, perhaps because Mary was angry, or perhaps because Flo was too embarrassed. I called Mary to confirm she was still okay to get the video. She was okay. It was during that same conversation that I learned that Flo had moved back in with her parents. When I ripped Take 8, as well as the original on DVD, I remembered that I hadn't actually watched Takes 2 through 7. Then I did just that. In between, they turned every remaining soft or forgiving part of my heart into unyielding concrete. To say they both lost control would be a gross understatement. The same disgusted expression appeared on their faces that had on her face in the original version. I almost cancelled the deal and copied the clip to everyone in Flo's address book before I calmed down and realized how it would affect my children. I went looking for Roger, but by this time, he had already left town. No, Flo will not be forgiven, and unfortunately, Roger will not have a third broken nose. I sent all the clips to Mary with a note that if I heard from anyone about my mistreatment of Flo, I would release the entire video. She must have done a good job because, one by one, Flo's parents, Eric and Patty, called to tell me that they understood why my marriage was over. I later learned that Mary told them the whole story and offered to show them the clips as evidence. Flo's mother was the only one who accepted her offer, having a hard time believing the story, she apparently threw up halfway through the original clip. After this, Flo did not resist the divorce. Through Mary, I learned that she had escaped the toxic atmosphere in her parents' home by renting a small apartment. I wasn't trying to rip her off in the divorce. 24 good years had to count for something. And I didn't want something to come back and bite me in the fifth place for my children if and when they finally got around to forgiving their mother. Flo did send me a heartfelt letter apologizing for her behavior and attempted cover-up. The loneliness she felt screamed from the pages. She begged for forgiveness, but only to come to terms with herself. Her pleas for me to forgive her for the sake of her parents, our children, and mutual friends almost brought me to tears, almost. I wasn't looking for a replacement yet but there was no shortage of single ladies vying for my attention. Ask any middle-aged woman about the availability of suitable, decent-looking men with good morals, and she will paint a bleak picture. I am looking forward to new meetings with them, and since I am not going to get married again, I think there will be many, many such meetings. What do you think of our unusual story today? I think such jokes are over the top and completely inappropriate. What's your opinion? Write in the comments. See you in the next videos.